So, what do you think of manufacturing your? Because obviously it used to be huge, right? It yeah, used to it was be big. like really, really big. Do you think it's going to come back? I don't think it will come back to New York in the same way. I think manufacturing could come back to the States, but I mean, like, the form of manufacturing is totally going to be flipped on its head. For New York right now, we have the thing where everybody's trying to save the garment district. Yep. Um, yep. Which is, it's a super interesting initiative, and I kind of have, like, an internal conflict about it, because, yep. like, if you know the garment district and you know the buildings that these people and, like, these factories reside in, yeah. Like, in order for garment manufacturing, a lot of it to even move forward here, you have to bring in a hell of a lot more, like, advanced machinery to even yeah. make it relevant because yeah. otherwise the cost of production is so expensive. Yeah, exactly. And cost of labor and everything, it's yeah. crazy. So, to be honest, even starting Knickerbocker, and, like, I think a lot of people when they start in the States, like, it had a great selling point, and, like, I believe in you know, owning where you're from and being proud of where you come from. And I think that's like the origin of where you should try to start and manufacture anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But like, it was also like incredibly young and naive and like didn't even understand the scale of production outside of like New York. The supply chain is global. And if you want to make the best product, you got to work within that. Yeah, you know? so do you, do you make anywhere else other than New York? We make in California, yeah. but actually what we're doing is we're starting to move a lot of our production into Europe. Yeah, yeah. like Portugal? Portugal. Or, yeah, yeah. We went there and to see the factories and everything over there, it makes like what we do here, it just, it makes it look like a sandbox because yeah. like the, the machine, the experience, like just the yeah. accessibility is so difficult. Like Cone Mills just closed. I know. Um, right? Bringing in like, so now even bringing in like, you know, high quality denim or like, man, the imports and everything, taxes, shipping, yeah, all it. of that to like actually, you know, build a business and factor all that into your margin and the product and like yeah. what somebody can actually afford to pay for that product at the end of the day. It's paper thin. Yeah. And then you're a small business and like manufacturing and production is so fucking tough. Shit mm -hmm. happens. Yeah. You know, and it always does. And if you're a small company and you don't have like a big bank account to go back to and just yeah, like, yeah, you yeah. know, whatever, like, you know, one mistake in cutting or anything yeah. can literally, it can. What's the biggest um, mistake you made? Is there anything that was just like. I mean, there's things like, yeah, like, like one of the biggest issues that happens in production. Yeah. Is basically when you take like your sample and your pattern yep. and then you do your grading and marking and all yep. of that. Something happened, something got flipped, but we basically cut all these coats, which, you know, they ended up being, you know, guys left over right, you know, it ended up being oh, the opposite. Shit. And nobody even figured the issue out until the end. And then it's like, all right. Yeah, yeah, over. yeah. Like it wasn't until you like put it, you're like, hey, yeah, you're like, what? something's messed up. <gasps> basically use the factory and what we have here is like a platform to like fuck up and make mistakes and try things out and yeah. do all of that. And you know, this business is more than anything, or any business is it's trial and error, yeah, that's you know? It. So for us to be able to actually house the machines to make the mistakes quicker than anyone else is like the biggest <laughs> We make mistakes of it all. quicker. <laughs> and that's, but that's like, you know, for us, that's always been, yeah. that's been the biggest part yeah. of it. The Made in USA thing for us is more about ethics and values. Yeah, so you, you know? can go to Portugal and yeah, find but that Yeah, but it's, you have yeah. to find that and then like market yeah. that and make it all And spend time together. at those factories and all yeah. of that stuff. I really believe like it's not where you make, it's how you make. And it's like if you do spend time and you visit a ton of factories and then you build a relationship with an amazing factory. Yeah. If it's in Portugal, I mean, yeah. it doesn't matter where you make. There is a misunderstanding of, you know, what quality goods actually are. But I think that's and the I think same that's with like made in USA. I think the same with like selvage denim. It's just like a, a selvage denim doesn't necessarily mean quality. Yeah, it's a characteristic. Know? And I think the consumer sometimes is confused by that. So yeah. they're like, it has to be made in America. Yeah. It has to be selvage. It's like yeah. you can get dirty, cheap selvage from, yeah. you know, I don't know, wherever. I'm wherever. not going to say where. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean it's good quality. And you can make a really shit product in L.A. Yeah. and a, probably a really great one in China. So it's yeah. just not about that. Yeah. But it is, it's hard. I think that's what Heritage sort of ushered in. It ushered in this like new consumer who cared more, which is great. Yeah. But then I think it's also confused people where they're yeah, just very sure. rigid about the way they buy. You that's kind of how I was, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was also because, you know, 
that I was just the product of my environment. That's what I had been taught. Time. Yeah. You know? So but the And now you're and a product of your don't environment. Get me now. Wrong. Like I think people definitely like over exploit it or abuse foreign economy and like that's a I mean that's Big a whole time. for me like Big that was like the biggest bit. hindrance in technology and like its development within manufacturing because Nobody, everyone who had the money, what's the point in investing in the technology when you can take advantage of, you know, you yeah. know, super cheap labor? That's it. What's the point? Uh, so yeah. I say is like, you hold up an iPhone and then you look at the sewing machine some of these people are working at, you just say, oh, well, look, for how much we consume in clothing, yeah. it just really doesn't make sense. Yeah. You know, it should be much more advanced for what it is. But I think, you know, these things are all starting to turn yeah they are um right? and because production has been in places like china for so long and you know perhaps working conditions 20 you know some years ago were really poor yeah but they've been on the pulse of manufacturing they've kind of grown with the times because i mean they've seen labor prices go up there big you know? time lately um, it's been a yeah. bit of a problem yeah, yeah. Um, younger yeah. kids not wanting to get into, yeah. you know, production, which is this, that's an issue across, across the board. The board yeah. Um, yeah. and you can't, do you find that here? Them? Oh, big time. Yeah. You know, we, you know, Knickerbocker is, we're a small batch factory. Mm -hmm. Um, we're definitely, we don't operate like the other guys. We brought in younger guys and we trained them, yeah. you know, we brought it and but the issue is they don't hang around. You know, they're really? designers. They want to go do their thing. And look, there's nothing wrong with that. No, of that was kind of the platform, you know, that, I mean, that was just the platform we offered to them. We made it yeah. pretty easy. Yeah. Um, I think it's cool because you build up a really, you know, awesome community around that. Yeah, um, but I'll also say is like, for the most part, we're not really trying to grow our production out of here that much. Yeah. We're really just focusing on doing what we're good at and using it as more of like a lab, yeah. you know, so yeah, it's like exactly. to learn, experiment, do stuff like that. We have like our cutting room concept, and that's kind of how that works. Where it's like every month we'll put out a couple things. Yeah. We offer them up at like pre sale, and it gives yeah. us a way to like try stuff out, get yeah. feedback, and um, kind of know, like, have the expectation of how well it's going to do, which yeah, is nice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it's so crazy to see like how our retailers buy versus like our online guys buy. Your literal guys, yeah, yeah. exactly. And it's just like, you know, so we and always how try. how do they differ then? You know, if you don't have a very good buyer or somebody who really is in touch with the market and yeah. really in touch with the customer walking in their door, yeah. I mean, it's very difficult to, you know, to buy into some, like some of our products because yeah. it's just too risky and we're not even a very risky brand, honestly. This is it, yeah. We're not doing anything. God. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but like, they'll be like, ah, oh, you know what? Like that collar shape is, I don't know if our yeah. customer is going to like, you know, so it's little, nuts. little so things. Very safely buying. Is it because they are just like so worried about buying crazy shit? They're buying very, very safely and people are going direct to to buy the cool stuff. I think that's the that's vendors. the birth of all these niche brands and niche markets. I mean, people want something unique and identifiable and something that expresses their individuality. I mean, that's the birth of fashion. So I think, you know, as as everything becomes more and more just normal across the board, like other cool people, you know, they pop up. Yeah. But then it becomes the issue of okay, like you have this really unique product but identifying your market, how big that market is, and yeah. if you can actually build a business out of it. It's a super difficult landscape, and it's very different as well for men's and women's. You know, That's very women's true, yeah. is, yeah, I mean, for us, I can only speak for, you know, the men's market. Yeah, yeah. I would say it's like, we're on trend, but we're not really trend driven. And yeah. that really is like the definition of menswear. It's just like That's reappropriation it. of timeless classics and exactly. like putting your contemporary twist on it. Exactly. Um, and guys buy, they, they love getting into a brand and buying back into that brand. Yeah, so okay, that's, well, that's also like, fans, yeah, right? our basics and stuff. I mean, you know, that's how the guy buys. Like he'll, yeah. he'll come and we'll see a customer. He'll come, he'll buy one medium tube tee, you yeah. know, and white. And yeah. then he'll come back the next week or something or a couple of weeks later, he'll buy the short sleeve Henley, the long sleeve Henley, the pocket tee, a printed tee. He'll get them in white and black foam across the board. Whoa, I'm That's in the it. sun again. Fuck it, can we stop? <laughs> yeah, I know.